want to thank everybody for coming. Before we start any great and important undertaking, we will have the flag of the United States brought in. So if you would please, ri please rise. The color guard is brought in by Cadet uh, Ray, who is a member of the Knickerbocker Grays, the oldest after school activity in the country founded here in the Upper East Side in 1881. Color guard, post the color. Cadet Ray will also lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Retire the colors. Please be seated. Good evening, everyone. I'm Harold Holzer. I have the honor of serving as director of Roosevelt House. And on behalf of Jennifer Rabb, the president of Hunter College, I want to welcome you to our house and tell you just a little bit about it and why it is such a perfect venue for NDD and its first annual awards of this type. Um, as many of you know, and as we've been talking about in the front row, this is the home that uh, Sarah Delano Roosevelt built for Franklin and Eleanor and their children. They had a few children by that point. Uh, as a Christmas gift, combination Christmas and wedding gift. And it was one of the most uh, consequential gifts of their life, but it came with a slight catch. And that is that Sarah was moving in with them. <laughs> but as she assured them, it was in two totally separate dwellings. Yes, the street door was one door, but as you come in, you may have noticed one door to the right and one door to the left. But when Eleanor, uh, when uh, uh, Sarah got here, she immediately proclaimed that the rooms were much too small for people of their social position and that the walls, therefore, the interior walls should be taken down in the parlors. And as Eleanor um, later said, my mother-in-law was on my side of the house for the next 25 years sometimes at the least expected moments, which is kind of the most romantic thing Eleanor ever said about, about her life here. But it is, it, as we've been discussing, this was the launching pad for Eleanor's career outside the house. Um, you're sitting in what were the kitchens of the house. We're, we're down a little deeper than the original kitchens, but a room that Eleanor was not at her best in. And as her mother-in-law told her, you should find something to do outside the house since you can't cook and can't do much of anything. Um, and she went out and became a volunteer at the East Side Settlement House. And of course, from there, the first lady of the state, the country, and the world. But, and our human rights program here is dedicated to, um, to Eleanor Roosevelt. Our public policy program is devoted to Franklin Roosevelt, who recovered from his bout with polio in this house uh, and um, learned to move about, gave his first fireside chat upstairs uh, the day after his election to the presidency. And um, most consequentially, we think, in the period from his 1932 election to his 1933 inauguration, used this house as his transition headquarters. So we are in the building where the New Deal was devised and honed, and in the house where Frances Perkins was interviewed to become the first woman member of the cabinet. And instead of saying, what a great honor, she said, um, I'll do it only if you agree to do minimum wage, maximum hours, disability insurance, and also old age pensions, as she called it. So this is also the house where Social Security was born. Um, so it's amazing, and it's amazing honor to have you. And it's amazing for the house of Governor Roosevelt to be, uh, to be honored by the presence of a governor. So Governor David Patterson, great honor to have you. <laughs> Howard, I'm giving it to you.
So we want to welcome everybody, uh, and, and we have a, treat this as a salon, in the sense this is the first of a salon series, a Liberty Salon series, uh, where we're giving the award. Uh, we're going to talk about New Democratic Dimensions for a few minutes. I'm Howard Teach, uh, founder and, and, and chair, along with Tom and uh, Thomas Costa and Lori Sutton as chairs, and, and of course we're really honored that David Patterson, former governor, is a member of our board and, and has made such a difference in the organization. So we're delighted. Th this is actually, we're starting the next 40 years. Uh, it began after the Carter campaign. I was head of Citizens. We had about 3,000 volunteers between the volunteer coordinator, uh, Roger Hubbard, and myself who said to us upon the loss, what do we do now? And so, so we had this idea, you know, of forming a group. And uh, we had the first event, I think we had a couple hundred people, and we went from there. And, and it's had a history that's been really very successful. And I want to mention two things to begin with. Um, one is, uh, and, and tonight's about really going over and part of an oral history series in a way, there's been a lot that's taken place and what we're all recognizing that a lot of young people who don't know the history. So we want to bring a lot, a lot of discussions like this together over a period of time, which will all be taped, tonight's getting taped, uh, so people will know what's taken place all these years. It's, it's an important aspect of something that really hasn't been done. Um, Many years ago, there was a woman named Carol Hausman who did many fundraising events for everybody from presidents to senators at 40 Central Park South. And she said to me the best advice when we first started and our first fundraiser was up there honoring Ele Eleanor Clark French, which Gillian knows. Um, and for Gillian and I, it's actually quite an anniversary in a way. It's 50 years since we met at the McGovern campaign. Uh, doing Citizens Committee, and uh, almost to the day, uh, practically. And so at that time, Carol said to me, the important part of forming a new group is just keep it going. She said there are going to be times it does fabulously well. There are times that it's not going to do quite as well. Put your head down, keep it going. And so we've had those ups and downs, and, and uh, in the sense we're looking at this as, as NDD 2.0, it's a great new start with a fabulous board uh, of about 25 people, uh, and many are here tonight who you'll get to, to meet as presenters. Uh, the second thing that was, was terribly important in Gillian, it was Ted your, who said it to us. Uh, he spoke to us in the 80s, and he said, at the very end, he said, I hope you all live up to the name, which is a new dimension for the Democratic Party. Um, we are treating this as small n, small d, small d now, uh, and it's independent thinking Democrats really thinking about what we can do for America to, to lead a discussion uh, and to take a look at the kinds of things that we should be doing. Um, I, I, along with Roger, was the first co-chairs, and then Tom Acosta, uh, together with two others, Cleta Henry and, and Doug Friedman, uh, took over Tom uh, has sustained it for so many years, and, and then the two of us now have joined forces again uh, in the past few years. Um, together now with Lori Sutton, who many of you know of and we're so thrilled as, as co-chair with the three of us. So, Tom, I turn it over to you. Yeah. <laughs> Tom, I turn it over to you for comments. So wonderful to see you. I don't know if this is working. As, yeah. Uh, well, Howard wanted me to talk about my participation in NDD in as much as I s became a member about a year and a half after you founded it. And uh, at that time, I was um, a union official, uh, organizing director for a rather large union in New York. And uh, uh, Ronald Reagan had just been elected president. And uh, one of his first acts was to fire the air traffic controllers. Uh, and uh, 
sending a f uh, red flag to uh, all of his followers that it was open day on organized labor. And uh, of course, we saw a precipitous uh, decline uh, over the next uh, 20 years, and with that, a decline of the middle class in this country, uh, and um, uh, uh, much, uh, much more um, expansive polarization. And that was one of the things that uh, uh, I joined up uh, was because I had lived in Chile for a while uh, during the Allende administration, and uh, I saw a country go from uh, a feeling of, of, of hope, of uh, optimism about the future, and in 11 short months go from there to a coup d'etat and the replacement of what was then the longest standing democracy in South America. Now, that's not saying a whole lot. We're talking maybe 40, 50 years but it was the longest standing democracy, and it had uh, dem democratically elected uh, uh, its president. And um, so it was a, it was a difficult time and a, and a troublesome time, and uh, I didn't think that the Democratic Party was really looking at the issues in an in-depth way. They were playing <coughs> presidential politics every year, or midterm politics uh, every year, and um, uh, the policy discussions were, were scant. I, I certainly found very few uh, outlets uh, for policy uh, discussions, uh, and uh, and we found that the, a lot of uh, uh, the, the really good thinking and uh, innovative thinking was happening in other parts of the country. And we spent a good deal of time bringing people to New York, Democrats, uh, who were uh, blazing new trails and uh, 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 doing innovative things in their respective areas of the country. And we decided, let's bring them to New York and expose them to uh, uh, what were then, pr for the most part, independent Democrats. Most of them weren't affiliated with uh, clubs uh, and uh, uh, and that's how we programmed, and it was, uh, it's been a wonderful experience. Uh, we're hoping to, uh, to do that. Uh, we've got incredibly talented people like David, Laurie, uh, Chris, Alex, uh, a lot of others. And uh, we're hoping to, uh, uh, to rekindle that because uh, if we talked about polarization in 1980, the incremental polarization steps uh, uh, since then have led us to a real uh, tr uh, fork in the road. Uh, we are either going to defend democracy, and that's one of our overarching uh, 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 missions, or we're going to succumb to fascism. I don't see a, a middle road. Uh, so th uh, that's hopefully the kinds of things that we'll be tackling. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's a real privilege to be here this evening. And uh, in addition to what has been said already by Howard and, and Tom, and we'll, we'll be listening for you soon here, Governor uh, Patterson, but I, I came into this group a day after I stepped aside from the mayor's campaign in February of 2021. And Howard called me and I said, well, who's with this group? And he mentioned the governor and Tom and others. And as I was rethinking, really, how could I best contribute? Because after all, I mean, Gillian, when we first met when I was a White House fellow and you and your husband and I was working for the drug czar that year, uh, it's always been about leadership and it's about leadership now. And I would say that for any of us, and I'll look back just to my short-lived campaign, Governor Patterson, the role that you played during that campaign when we had a chance to meet, a chance to go to lunch, and you made yourself available uh, to, to just, you know, share your insights and to offer your encouragement and to help me learn and see things in a little different way than I had had life experience to learn and see them, and then, of course, to bring my own life experience. But as I look at where we are now, I, 
I know many of us watched the governor's debate last night and, uh, um, you know, to know what a crossroads this is for us as a city, a state, and a country. But to look out at this audience, you know, and to see, you know, Russell and, and Alex and Siraj I spoke to earlier, and then to see uh, Cadet uh, Miguel Ray, to know that the next generation of public servants is well on their way, I'm excited. And so I look forward to the future of this group, building upon the histories, the history of the past and all that has been brought up to this moment. You say I'm the young one. I, was in, I graduated from college in 1981, so actually that was my first presidential <laughs> election to vote in. And it's just really a joy. So, Governor, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you, and uh, you're playing cleanup here. So take us home, Governor. Hello, I'm David Patterson. I'm a recovering governor. <laughs> <coughs> so it's good to be here with all of you political junkies who finally have tried to find uh, a sense of enlightenment. Um, since this is the, the house where uh, so many great uh, laws and also changes in our society occurred, uh, I thought it was noteworthy to point out that when Social Security was passed, the average life expectancy was 65 years old. That's why they picked 65. And uh, it was President Roosevelt who had to fight very hard with Frances Perkins to keep it at 65 because uh, she thought it, it, it might have been lower because people were retiring in their 50s in those days. But it was the precursor to real um, government assistance for those who have worked hard and served people. And I would hope that that's what the Democratic Party stands for. Sometimes the Democratic Party struggles because what we've been able to do that the Republicans generally have not been able to do is put together coalitions. So we have had coalitions voting for Democrats from time to time that you probably couldn't put them in the same room for too long. Uh, particularly when the Southern Democrats would vote with the uh, Northern Democrats, even though they had a completely different idea of how race relations worked. And the brilliance of Lyndon Baines Johnson when he uh, was able to establish Medicaid um, was that he made concessions to those Southern states that we have to live with now. If you live in New York, 50% of your Medicaid is paid by the federal government if you live in Louisiana, Mississippi, or South Carolina, 78% of, uh, uh, of, of your, uh, your issues are paid for by the government. And these states had governors who were in the uh, National Governors Association, and they used to get up and talk about how people had to fend for themselves. You can't always ask the government to bail them out. Um, states like South Carolina who gets back $100 billion more than it pays in federal taxes, telling everyone else they shouldn't be supporting on government. But um, it's, it's a, a, a pleasure to be here uh, in, uh, also in the House of Roosevelt. When I was very young, I was turned down for employment when I actually had recruited the people who were employed at this job. And I was so frustrated, I started to have academic problems at Columbia because I was thinking, why am I working so hard in school if no one's ever going to hire me? And I went to see this professor who taught this class, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the New Deal. He taught a couple of Roosevelt classes, and his name was Basil Rauch. And when I went to see him, he told me that he showed me a picture, and I really couldn't see the picture that well, but he described it to me, and it was Roosevelt being carried into the Democratic National Convention in 1932 to accept his nomination. The problem was that Roosevelt had practiced in the pool at the executive mansion for six weeks so that he could walk the 50 to 100 feet to the lectern and accept the nomination, and he did not want to be helped in. He didn't think that was a good image to try to become president of the country. Well, as he comes through the door, people who were trying to be helpful picked him up and carried him in, and according to Professor Rauch, his face was red as a beet. He was furious. Mm -hmm. But he, he made the speech and he moved on, and what the professor was saying to me 
is that you were discriminated against in that situation, but you didn't do anything about it. Roosevelt overcame his disability by working hard and also remembering that people who were like him didn't often have the opportunities that he got. And that turned my whole life around. And um, who knows that the stone that the builder refused would not only become the governor of the state of New York, but it would swim in the same po pool that Roosevelt did. So, so this evening has several parts to it, and, uh, and it's going to move along. Uh, this first part is, uh, was a presentation to give you a sense of NDD. I just want to add that we've done some of the leadership here, uh, took leadership in doing events for 9-11, uh, which we did in Carl Schurz, uh, and had a couple hundred people who came to it, as well as uh, setting up an east side world, uh, strike that. Um, we set up an East Side Freedom Square Coalition uh, to stand with Ukraine. And for that, we had several events, a vigil and a press conference. And, and actually, uh, Russell watched over this, raised enough money that we sent six kids to camps in Lviv from, uh, f from a different part of Ukraine. So it's the kind of thing that we want to do as, as NDD, is be involved on the forefront of, of issues of importance and as Tom has pushed this time around, that we stand uh, up front on some policy issues as well. Um, saying the following, as, as you talked about coalitions, we wanted, as in the past, that people walk in a room and say, how did you get everybody like this in the room who have such varying points of view in the Democratic Party? That's who we are. Um, we expect to have from right and left and center and, and, and everybody talking to each other to come up with a commonality that stands for what the best of all is for the Democratic Party as a voice. So that's what you're to tonight. We're finishing up with this part. The next part is the presentations, which Tom will lead. Then we're coming back and Delorean and I will lead that part as a discussion uh, together with our award recipients uh, and, and David. Um, in terms of, of anecdotes and stories, and, and we're going to speak a bit and then involve the audience as well. So not only for you to ask questions, but for you to tell your stories, because we have as many legends in the audience as we do uh, other, uh, on any evening I could imagine. And so uh, that's the evening, and, and uh, we'll head over to your roles, Tom. Uh, those sitting way back there, there are a couple of empty uh, seats uh, here in the orchestra section of, of the room. Okay. Uh, let me just first uh, uh, tell you, uh, we got a call earlier this morning uh, from uh, uh, one of uh, Tonio Burgos' uh, associates, and uh, Tonio is, was feeling very ill and... Uh, uh, you know, had to go home. Uh, he couldn't be here t tonight. Uh, uh, but uh, he did... I'm looking at this. His, uh, his award will be uh, accepted by, okay, a member of his, uh, his, of his firm. Uh, secondly... Uh, I think uh, a lot of you know that uh, Charlie's wife, Alma, has been sick for some time. And uh, as recently as a couple of months ago, she was home. Uh, she wasn't feeling well, but she was home. Uh, I understand that uh, now she's been hospitalized for a little bit. And, uh, and uh, so Charlie uh, needs, wants to spend as much time as possible uh, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I wish we, we told him, please don't even think of coming. Just uh, take care of Alma. Uh, David Patterson will fill in for you. And, <laughs> and uh, he'll accept it and uh, make the statements that, that I'm sure you would have been making. David, let's bring you up here.
Well, uh, uh, Congressman Rangel, of course, has been a tremendous Democrat and strong leader and really met with a horribly, I think, overblown investigation toward the end of his congressional career, which he weathered the storm, but it, I think, was really unnecessary. And it was one of the situations that made me realize how acrimonious uh, the uh, issue is between the parties and the uh, type of um, conduct that he deplored uh, when he was uh, the chair of the Ways and Means Committee and the chair of the House Select Committee on Narcotics and Abuse. Um, he really, um, from First Avenue to Morningside Avenue in Harlem, could see the changes during the time of his tenure. And he began his tenure uh, as kind of like a young upstart running against the sitting congressman, Adam Clayton Powell, who uh, had, was the first uh, one of the first African-American ca city council members in 1941 and then uh, went to Congress a few years later. And so this was a difficult situation trying to take out really a legend uh, in the Harlem community, but he was actually able to do that. And then um, his uh, constant voice, um, always uh, speaking to what he thought was right and at times even to go against the party, he actually had a press conference to condemn our conduct in Libya under President Obama. And so that'll just let you know uh, how um, brave he was, how strong he was, and how, uh, what a wonderful difference uh, he made around this country and really around the world, particularly with his uh, negotiations with the South African government and then other African uh, leaders he really was an international ambassador who came from the same borough that all of us live in. So on behalf of him, uh, I want to uh, thank NDD uh, for th this award that, uh, that he's receiving. And um, I know if he were here, he'd say something like, well, thank you very much. It's great <laughs> to get that award. <laughs> Howard, uh, Tom, all of you. <laughs> I need people like you when I'm in Washington. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the, the award reads uh, NDD 2022 Liberty Awards in recognition of your commitment to democracy and your lifetime of service and leadership which epitomizes the best of our country. This award is presented by New Democratic Dimension. So I will just run it over to you, David. Moving right along, uh, and I suppose Eileen and uh, Oscar should come up. They're going to be presenting uh, the uh, At Liberty Award to uh, Donia Burgos, which will be accepted by Matthew Kalishman, one of Donia's uh, most trusted colleagues, and uh, he'll, he'll, I'm sure, have a few brief remarks. Hello? Oh, yeah. yeah. It's working. Thank you. Good evening, honored guests, friends, um, proud member here of the NDD. My name is Eileen Mackel, and I am delighted to be saying a few words on behalf of Tonio, our awardee, Tonio Burgos. So, I, unfortunately, I do not know Tonio very well. So when Howard asked me to say, you know, come up, he said, just say a few words. He said, just check out his bio. So I did that, <laughs> and, I <laughs> and I was, yeah, and I was kind of flabbergasted by the whole thing. And I said, even worse than, you know, not worse, but looking at this bio was the fact that anybody could think that I could sum up this man's lifetime achievements in 60 seconds, because that's what they've given me. Um, I expect to see a sign any minute. Um, but anyway, 
this to give you some highlights and from, like you said, a three page uh, bio there, he served as commissioner of the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey for 15 years under Governor Mario Cuomo. His lists of boards and committees under Senator Her Hillary Clinton, under Governor Philip Murphy, under Governor Cuomo, and that's just a few. His footprint is in economic development, transit, education, parks, the, um, uh, it goes on, legislative affairs, business, finance, and numerous um, charitable organizations. And again, I'm only giving you a small little thing here. Um, in addition to that, his awards, I said his awards and recognitions just go on and on and on. But since I only have 60 seconds here, I'm probably out doing that. I'd just like to say um, on behalf of NDD and myself, I am extremely honored to be awarding uh, Matthew on behalf of uh, Antonio, the Liberty Awards for the NDD. Well, as you know, I'm not Antonio. So Eileen and, and, and Howard, uh, on behalf of Antonio, my boss and I have to say, you know, after working with him for a number of years, a really great man. I accept the New Dimensions Liberty Award. Antonio badly wanted to be here, but uh, he does have the flu, and you know, in the age of COVID, people still do get the flu and other things. Uh, Tony wanted me to uh, let everyone know how grateful he is to Howard and the board of the NDD for recognizing him. Uh, in selecting him for the for the for the first Liberty Award, and for of course for the in introduction by Eileen. Thank you very much. Uh, Tony asked me also to congratulate the other honorees tonight. Uh, Congressman Congressman Rangel, who's not here. Uh, Chung Seto. Uh, Gillian Sorensen. Who ha he has a lot of comments. <laughs> He's had a lot of really nice things to say about both of, both, both, both of you and is uh, really proud to be included in the company. And uh, you know, unlike Groucho Marx, uh, Antonio has no problem being in a company uh, that will have him as a member. <laughs> yeah. This honor, I have to say, and, and I'm sure everyone else uh, would say is, is well deserved from his early days as uh, a young Robert Kennedy staffer, campaign staffer uh, in, in Texas on through his tenure as Chief of Staff to Governor Mario Cuomo, 34 years at the helm of Antonio Burgos and Associates, decades of leadership in his roles at the Democratic National Committee and the uh, Democratic uh, Governors Association. Antonio has advised office holders, candidates, their staffs, presidents, senators, congressmen, governors, mayors, city commissioners, and maybe a dog catcher or two <laughs> throughout the United States and in a few international ones uh, to boot. As a proud son of Puerto Rico, from economic relief efforts in the Caribbean since the late 1960s to his 10 years as a Port Authority Commissioner where he spearheaded the implementation of Minority Women Business Enterprise Program in 1989, Minority and Women's Rights have been the, at the forefront of his activities. And from my personal vantage point as Tonio's Director of Finance, I see the breadth of the philanthropic and political contributions that Tonio makes. As a matter of fact, I have carpal tunnel syndrome from the, from the uh, signing of the checks. You know, everything from a basketball, uh, sponsoring a basketball scholarship to, you know, major uh, contributions to candidates that would never have any, you know, impact back for him. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, and most of this is done quietly with no recognition. According to my rabbi, the biggest mitzvahs, good deeds, are the ones that you do when you expect nothing in return. So Tonio's life has been full, filled with these types of mitzvahs. 
So it's my honor uh, tonight to accept the award on behalf of Tonio, and thank everyone. Wow, and we're just heating up here. Next, I'd like to um, introduce you to One of the problems when you have one of these timeline things and you don't have your reading glasses. <laughs> uh, next, I'd like to introduce you to Alex Bores and Russell Squire, two members of uh, our board who will be presenting to Chung Seto uh, uh, our Liberty Award tonight. Uh, I'm Alex Boris. This is Russell Squire, President of Community Board 8. We'd like to welcome you to the area of Community Board 8 and the 73rd Assembly District. Uh, and we have the honor of presenting to Chung Sito. Uh, Chung has many of my favorite traits in a person. Uh, she's a Yankee fan uh, who also roots for the Mets. They're both from New York. There is no conflict there. Uh, she's a Scotch lover. But most importantly, she's a, she's a fierce fighter for a, a better tomorrow. Uh, Chung has set many firsts in the Asian American community. Uh, she was the first uh, executive director of the New York State Democratic Party and the first Asian American woman to be executive director of any state party. Uh, she was the first Asian American spokesperson for a cabinet member and as advisor and campaign manager played a huge role in New York electing its first Asian American citywide official and state senator. Uh, Chung uh, is constantly fighting for uh, immigrant rights, for women's rights in both her political work and nonprofit work, uh, two sets of issues that uh, remain ever important today and, and even more so with recent events. She continues to advocate for and organize her, uh, I'll dare say, constituents in the 65th Assembly District as president of UDO. Uh, and she's preparing the next generation of public servants uh, as a founder of Eleanor's Legacy, uh, which she refers to as the uh, best farm system in politics. Again, baseball fan. <laughs> Um, and you might wonder how it's possible that Chung can accomplish all of these things, uh, but it's somewhat predetermined uh, because her name literally means the best. <laughs> so it is our honor to present uh, this award to Chung Sito. Wow, that was quite an introduction. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Russell, for that. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, I'm deeply, deeply honored and humbled to be uh, in this company of just legends, as uh, Howard has said. My dear friend, Governor David Patterson, I'm so glad to see you. It's been a while. Glad to see you doing well. Uh, congratulations to the other honorees, certainly Congress Member Charlie Rangel and uh, Tony Burgos, who I was really looking forward to seeing again tonight. We we haven't our paths haven't crossed uh, of late, but uh, please send yeah. regards. Yes, Gillian, it's so good to meet you, and uh, look forward to serving on a presentation later to learn a little bit more about you. And um, so thank you. Um, I also want to thank NDD, Howard, Lori, Tom, and all the board members. Uh, this is extraordinary. Club and when Howard first came and spoke to me about the idea of uh, Liberty Awards and first annual award, I just said, wonderful, and then he called and said, well, we want to honor you, and I said, oh, <laughs> uh, there's so many others, um, and I provided names, and anyway, here we are. So I, um, I'm, I'm again really uh, humbled. Um, 
you know, there's been so many women um, who are role models for me, and I really dedicate uh, this really award to them. Um, and I'm glad that we're here at the Roosevelt House, uh, certainly Elner's Roosevelt, and you heard that I'm a founding member of Elner's Legacy. Um, I see Brett McSweeney here, so thank you, Brett, former executive director of Elner's Legacy. Um, I admire Elner's strength and independence and her extraordinary work to lift up women, poor, oppressed immigrants, um, and particularly children. So it's really just good to be in this house to accept this award. Um, like I said, I wanna dedicate it to, to, to many of the women who made it uh, for me. And one of them is obviously my mom who uh, left China when she was barely an adult and um, with no formal education moved to Hong Kong and then uprooted the entire family, my grandmother, my father, my three sisters, for us to come to America so that we can have a chance at reaching the American dream. And our immigrant story is just like many immigrant stories. Um, when I got into politics, you know, my mom didn't quite understand what I was doing, <laughs> but I did overhear her tell her friend, she says, you know, Chung is the best party planner. <laughs> you know, she plans all these incredible parties and the president would show up or the governor and senators, you know, she's a great party planner. <laughs> yes, mom, I'm a great <laughs> party planner. Um, you know, to my former junior high school teacher, Mrs. Virginia Key, who could not be with us tonight, but I mean, she taught all her immigrant students um, to really excel, but never always forget the community that you represent. I remember uh, seeing Mrs. Key's poster as she ran as the first Asian American candidate running for a public office and saw her poster when I was, you know, leaving school and just remarkable to see someone who looked like me on that poster and really open up doors for me and so many others along the way. So, yes. And to Judith Hope, um, as many know, it's the longest serving state Democrat chair um, in New York and she barely knew me and hired me as the first executive director of, you know, in the, my capacity as executive director and first Asian American woman in, in that capacity. And um, so Judith, thank you. There's just so many ways that other women have always helped me along the way. And um, I also want to give a shout out because I mentioned her name is um, Hillary's 75th birthday is today. So uh, happy birthday, Hillary. Um, so it's because of these extraordinary women and many more who really has helped open doors of opportunities for me throughout the many years. Um, and to really show my deep gratitude to them and paying it forward, I've always made a commitment as I got into politics to really open doors for people who look like me. Um, it's a commitment I hope you know, every single person makes, but also particularly if you're in a position of power and you're able to do that, to reach back and to really make sure that the opportunities are there for, for the next generation. And so I am um, pleased really to see Sharon Lee, who's the former Queensboro president here. Sharon, stand up. Um, you know, Sharon has, um, was incredible during COVID, during her term, I mean, she really, you know, as we were talking, she would be calling me as she's delivering PPEs and meals and finding, you know, homes for people and hospital beds. And so it's extraordinary. And, and um, it's because of Sharon and Grace Meng and the women who are newly elected in the city council, they're the leaders of today and tomorrow. And I'm just so pleased because I know that they will always reach back, always open the doors for other Asian American, Asian American women to, to come forward. And so I just wanna close, um, as Eleanor Roosevelt once said, the battle for the individual rights of women is one of long standing, and none of us should countenance anything which undermines it. 
you know, she's our, one of my sheroes, and as I read this, as all feeling, women's rights are being undermined right now. We no longer have autonomy over our bodies. There are candidates who want to even repeal more rights as we speak. So I hope all of you will make a plan to vote. I know I can count on you. I know that I can count on you to bring families and friends. Um, early voting starts on Saturday, as a reminder. Um, there isn't a more important election than this one. And we really saw it last night in the debate, the contrast between Governor Hochul and Lee Zeldin couldn't be more stark. And if we want our state to move forward in the right direction, we have to vote and, re and elect Governor Kathy Hochul. So I'm just thrilled to be here. We'll be talking a little bit more later on, um, but thank you. Thank you so much for this honor and this award. Wow, I need a minute to take all of that in. That was wonderful. Our final award will be presented by Chris and um, that will be to uh, Gillian Sorensen. To Chris. Good evening. Hi, I'm uh, I'm Chris O'Brien. I'm a newer newer member of NDD. Um, Howard um, grabbed me by the elbow one day as we're we're neighbors and. Um, the rest is, is history, and we've been having a lot of fun doing a lot of great events, uh, this one especially. Um, so ladies and gentlemen, uh, NDD colleagues, distinguished honorees and friends, uh, it's with great pleasure tonight that I introduce our final award recipient, uh, Gillian Sorensen. Um, and it's, it, it's been really interesting listening to all the, um, the introductions and the speeches here tonight, because. You know, Every one of these recipients we have here are are so distinguished, um, and and the careers are so inspiring. You know, I'm a younger guy. Uh, you know, I think I've I've accomplished some things in my life, but you know, there's so much more to do, and there's so many more lives to touch. And every one of the recipients tonight has really gone so far above and beyond. Um, not to mention, uh, you know, Gillian's uh, career. So. Um, where to start uh, with with Gillian's history here? Uh, you know, I don't know Gillian personally, but uh, going through and pouring over what I could find and what was provided, uh, just inspirational. Um, I'm going to start with the UN. Um, Gillian, having served as Assistant Secretary General and Special Advisor for Public Policy at the United Nations under a number of Secretaries General. Uh, she was able to further the noble goals of pursuing wide-ranging international peace initiatives, human rights, refugee support, and of course, women's and girls' rights, where she's been an ardent and outspoken supporter uh, thereof. Uh, really totally inspiring, and I actually was able to watch some of your interviews and videos, and it was really so, <laughs> it was so, it just so much passion in in that pursuit to really make a difference uh, with the lives of so many is just, again, inspirational. Um, <laughs> known, and this is, this is something I'm sure you get all the time, uh, known as the diplomat's diplomat here in New York City, uh, Gillian also served as the commissioner for the UN Consular Corps, a um, uh, position you held uh, for 12 years. Uh, one can only imagine the challenges that come along with that job with, with so many um, diplomats and politicians and being able to kind of wrangle and manage and help, help them be able to do their jobs while plugged into this city that's so busy um, with, you know, with everything that's going on. So I, I think that, that for me, you know, being a former, uh, having lived in the area around the UN was especially um, interesting and, and amazing. Um, 
Gillian remains active today in politics and civic life, uh, serving on the board of international, the International Rescue Committee and as a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, among others. Um, the list goes on, and I know we're pressed for time, so I'll, I'll just um, say thank you for everything that you've done uh, you know, for us here and as Americans, but also on that international stage. It's truly inspiring, um, and so it's with great pleasure that I present Gillian Sorensen, the 2022 New Democratic Dimensions Liberty Award. Thank you so much, Chris, for those very kind words. And a special thanks to Howard Teat, my longtime friend, founder of ND, NDD, and, and uh, a member for all these years. Um, I, I'm very touched to be brought together with such a distinguished group, your, your board with Laurie Sutton, with Governor Patterson, with others. What a very special and uh, impressive group of leaders you have indeed. Um, I actually grew up in a Republican family, <laughs> but my father and mother were moderate Republicans of the type you don't see anymore. And the one thing they left me with was that politics is important and public service and political service are an honorable profession. And in their own work, they conveyed that to me, and then, of course, through my late husband, Ted, I, I came to believe that very, very deeply, but also that the Democratic Party needs over time to be renewed and revived, and, and uh, uh, the world changes. We need more members. We need to think deeper and, and keep this uh, uh, an evolving and thriving uh, political party. So I came to New York straight out of college, but within a few months, I was finding my way to the Democratic Party. Um, I had majored in international relations and French and had this notion that I found my way over to the United Nations several times. I met a couple of young diplomats, and I just began developing this idea that if only I could find a way to, to, to work there, and then you will be surprised at how that happened. I'll say it in a minute if I can. I worked in Ed Koch's campaign, <laughs> the first one where he was one out of eight candidates. Nobody gave him a chance, but by golly, he won and served for 12 years, as we all know. And they offered me a chance to work on community boards. And to be honest, that didn't interest me. But I gathered my nerve and I said to him, sir, would you consider appointing me to this small office called the New York City Commission for the United Nations and Consular Corps? It was the city's liaison office with 30,000 diplomats. And he was walking out the door and he sort of turned his head and scoffed a bit and said, why are you interested? They're not doing anything. And I said, you're right, but they're missing an opportunity. And he said to me, if you think so, do, do a note for me. So overnight, I typed, remember typewriters, <laughs> a two-page note on why it mattered, what was at stake, and why it mattered to this city that the World Organization had its headquarters here, why it mattered that these young diplomats, these newly arrived missions at the United Nations, that those young diplomats would become foreign ministers, prime ministers, presidents of their own countries, and the experience they had of democracy in New York, in our diverse and amazing city, that that experience would stay with them forever. And the last line was, that I said was, if we can build bridges, not walls, we will have accomplished something, and New York will have the opportunity to call itself the capital of the world. He liked that, and he gave me the job, and I did it for all 12 years, and we did, I do believe, build bridges. From there, I was recruited into the UN Secretariat by then Secretary 
Bruters Ghali, then worked for Secretary General Kofi Annan, and on from there, many different roles over time. And it became, for me, the most challenging, gratifying, stimulating, and, and meaningful career that I could have wished for. But on the side, always was politics, democratic politics, supporting good candidates, winners and losers, I have to admit, but um, trying to do what we can to keep the party strong and 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 um, and I don't think I've ever ever missed a vote since the first chance I had in in New York. So these are difficult times, and the 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 divisions, the sharp divisions, the language that's being used really pains me, and I hope together we can move uh, the political parties to a better place and a better future. To all of you, warm thanks for this very special honor. Once again, I want to thank all of our honorees for the service that they've given to the city, state, and nation. And now we'll turn to the final segment of our program, and uh, that will be coordinated by Lori and uh, Howard. Yeah. So we're, we're going to have a conversation starting here and then involving all of us for about 10, 15 minutes. And um, uh, just a couple of things leading into Harold Holzer, one of the great historians and the director of Roosevelt House. Uh, we, when, when I mentioned this, said I really want to do it at Roosevelt House, and, and we couldn't be more thrilled that we're here at the first annual, and as I mentioned to you, we'd love to have the second annual here, and on and on and on. It's a perfect collaboration, and uh, just honored that we could work with you on something like this, Harold. Um, the other thing, I'd ask the board members just to stand up who are here, and this is just a part of the board. It's an extraordinary group. Suraj Patel wasn't <laughs> mentioned uh, his last name, and, and Oscar Torres wasn't mentioned his last name, so I mentioned it. Uh, and it's, it's a group that's extraordinary, and you get a sense of it, this is just a little part of it, of what we're going to be able to accomplish over the years uh, as we go forward. And, and one of the things that delights me is David um, brought this young fellow from the, the Knickerbocker group. If we can accomplish a sense of who we are to your age and to the generations in between, we've done a lot. And that's what we're setting out to do and that's what we're thinking about, is what message are we gonna put out? And that's how I'd like to start the discussion here. Over the years, we go back all a ways. Um, and you mentioned about women and international. Um, and um, what, what have we learned? You know, a lot of us are saying this isn't exactly the world we expected 30 years ago. Um, some things have advanced, other things not quite so. And I'd, I'd love to hear from you in terms of, of your thoughts, whether it be internationally, locally, or, or otherwise, a couple of minutes about what really stands out is uh, that, that we can learn from and go forward with. Well, I like to pay tribute to all the Iranian women who are marching in the streets. If we could learn anything, I want to take their page. Um, it's not the cover story that, that should be, and we're only getting snippets because Iran has shut its social media platforms and internet down. Uh, but what is getting out is beautiful. And they are just so courageous and so brave 
Um, there's some stats that says over 250 people really died, in, including young children, and, and thousands are being um, arrested. Um, but they're still protesting, and there are more around the globe. And I think, Gillian, you can also share with some ideas about that. And I just think that this is a, a new way that we've not seen. Um, and we really should do more to make sure that voice, that aim, that protest of wanting to more freedom, that they are successful. I would add that we've learned, if we didn't know before, that we cannot do it alone that we absolutely need others. Even superpowers need friends. We need to build these relationships. We need to remember in regard to Ukraine that it's not the US versus Russia, it's, it's NATO. It's all of us versus Russia, um, hoping, trying to defend Ukraine. That um, whether it's um, um, through the UN itself, or in other building other relationships with countries across borders, and not just superpowers like India or China or Brazil, but but small countries, middle-sized countries, they all have interests uh, in common with us, and we should treat them with respect. Um, get to know their representatives here, uh, learn what we can from them, uh, and and also introduce them when it's possible to our own democratic system. I think they are dismayed, many of them, with what they see happening in American politics these days. It's not what they remember, and they're worried about democracy. Uh, we used to be the role model to set the high standard, and many of them don't feel that's happening now. So we have a lot to do to set things right within our country, but, both, but also as a leader in the world. You know, I, would, I would ask, and uh, Laurie, if you would, but David, where, where does the state government come into play in terms of issues like that internationally? Do, does it get involved when, when you were governor? Do you take a look at those things, or is that simply a presidential rather than a state? Because we're an important people here. Well, what I would say is states like New York, Florida, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Illinois, California, ten Texas, they are states that are states, but they have international profiles based on the people who live there. And also, um, the UN is in New York, and New York is really just sort of like the transverse of, of world travel. But what I would say is that often what happens is that the, and we had uh, a number of offices in different countries around the world. For some reason, Governor Pataki closed them down. And um, and we tried to reopen them uh, during the Spitzer administration, during my administration. And, and we do actually have offices in other countries and trying to stimulate that dialogue and trying to be as much help as we can. But most of it is really just um, our feelings, but they mean things to people who are under strife and are struggling for their own freedom um, and it means something, I think there are probably more ways that we could get involved, but haven't done that as yet. And one of the things we've, uh, Chris, you here? Yeah, one of the things Chris has been talking about a lot, and we talked about it in terms of Ukraine, even when we were standing tall with them, really for humanitarian reasons, is fighting for peace rather than for war. And, and I think we need to start thinking about that and really pushing for that. In, in all kinds of things. And, and the idea, Chris, maybe on uh, the Iranian women issue, we should be speaking out um, and even having a policy point of view, Tom, the same thing. Let's talk about it afterwards. Um, That's great. I also want to mention that, you know, it's uh, at the state party, we would welcome delegations around the world. And they would make appointments to come to our office. And it will be a delegate, you know, I've sat with delegations from Germany, from all, uh, you know, governments <coughs> who come into our office and want to know what a New York State Democratic Party does. And we should do more of that. We should entertain 
um, and extend our, like you said, Delia, like just extend ourselves to other countries so that they can learn just about our process. Although I would tell you that once we started talking about political clubs, it got a little, you know, a little much. You mean the question always is like, you allow local people uh -huh. to have a voice? Yes, we do. It's called local clubs. <laughs> when, when we were doing NDD 1.0, let's call it, in the old days, we had an international group. And someone who's a friend of yours, John, Kevin Kim, uh, brought us, I remember, to the Korean uh, consulate uh, or embassy at the time. And we had a range of countries that we met with and sometimes couldn't understand why they wanted to meet with us. Um, but it was, it was a wonderful experience and something that we have on the, the, the front burner of, of continuing with. Laura, you obviously have had enormous experience in international. Um, it's just been such a treat this evening, listening and learning and, and, and absorbing all the wisdom uh, that's being shared. You know, before we welcome uh, two or three questions from the audience, I'd like to come back to you, Chung, where you began this discussion talking about the Iranian women and knowing now of your role in putting together the best farm team for <laughs> young women leaders. You know. Thinking back to Eleanor and her role, as she so eloquently shared, and I remember one of her favorite, one of my favorite quotes of hers, is when she said, "You must do the, the thing you think you cannot do." Can you just give us a, a flavor of this young, uh, the, well, this farm team that Eleanor's legacy that you founded and where it's going and how it might be some way that we can integrate. Thank you. Well, actually, the, it's Judith Hope who founded uh, Eleanor's Legacy when she was state Democratic chair, and I was executive director. Uh, what happened uh, was that um, after Hillary won her exhilarating Senate race, and we had engaged all these smart, brilliant, energetic women around the state who would travel and you know go upstate and talk to voters about Hillary. So now that she's won, we, don't, we didn't know what to do with them. And they kept calling, what do you want us to do? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so Judith decided that we would try to figure out a way where we would you know, try to get all these women in a room. Um, and, we, and our premise for Eleanor's Legacy was very simple. It's to recruit, train, and fund women running for office in New York. And we have, over the last decades, and, uh, and Brett, I think, has left, but um, we have raised millions to support women candidates, everything from town clerk, um, some local justices, the highway superintendent. So, you know, we have, um, you go to elderslegacy.com, and you can see the mission, and we post a questionnaire for women candidates for them to return. And a very aggressive board that we have, uh, we would you know, review the application. And many races we support financially, but a lot of the races upstate would just love our endorsement because our endorsement means it's like that seal of approval. So when I said that this is the best farm team, it is truly, this is our backbench. So who are our uh, luminaries? Um, Kathy Hochul. We supported Kathy Hochul when she ran for Erie County Clerk. And look at her now. Senator Gillibrand, you remember, Governor, when we came to you, when Judith came to you, and urged you to support picking Kirsten Gillibrand for U.S. Senate. And so these remarkable women, led by Judith Hope, um, over the years, and there are just many, you know, Crystal Peoples up in Buffalo. We we have so many graduates, and so it's an extraordinary program. Uh, hope all of you would join at our next event to hear more. We just endorsed 122 women running in New York State this cycle. So. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.
Can I add just, there's one coincidence of timing that links into this. Only yesterday I was with the United Nations group. They were marking the 75th anniversary of Eleanor Roosevelt's um, leadership and signing of the International Declaration of Human Rights. And uh, of course, President Truman asked her to do that. She demurred, but then he persuaded her. She was the only woman on the commission, but she really found her voice and her leadership role and was absolutely committed and then ended up dedicating the rest of her life to United Nations matters. So that's the Right, and another tidbit for people who don't know, yeah. um, the Democratic Party, particularly in New York, but nationally too, is uh, in New York, for example, I'll give New York because I, I don't want to fact check <laughs> nationally too, but I think it's national too, is that every position, let's say a district leader has to be both male and female. We just changed the law in New York County for non-binary citizens uh, who wants to run. So um, that's also now in the law. But that's Eleanor's work. She did that. She ensured that there was going to be gender uh, equity in, in all the party positions. And w one of the things I have to add is we're, uh, NDD, we're enormous fans of Judith Hope. Um, when she was head of the party, uh, we joined in with her for a couple of the Christmas parties and, and uh, to actually partnered with her on it uh, in terms of doing it. I remember one was at the Waldorf, I believe, with about 800 people. And uh, she's one of the outstanding leaders uh, that we've had in, in, in New York. Um, two, other, two comments, one on human rights, which I think the party has to do a lot more with and the country has to come back to paying attention to. I'm very big on human dignity these days, which is part of actually the International Declaration of Human Rights. And we have to get back to respectfulness. One of the things David's been talking about a lot, I hear him on the radio, various stations, um, is who are we? You know, who are we? What do we have to find of ourselves again? And the, the attention that we need to pay uh, to caring about other people in, in a most responsible way, to be able to talk to each other and, and to really make a difference in the future. David, if you'd come in, and then we'll open it up for some questions. Well, uh, earlier I talked about the remarkable ability of the Democratic Party to create coalitions. But we have coalitions at times, and we're really not taking advantage of the fact that we have them. Because we probably have to have some difficult conversations with each other about what our party's position is going to be moving forward. Because I'm afraid we're getting outflanked, and in two weeks, I don't even know what's going to happen to us in these uh, midterm elections. And I think a lot of that uh, has, uh, it, it got to this point because we haven't worked together and formulated policies that we might not all totally agree with, but we all understand the pragmatism as a uh, national party that, that we have to have among ourselves to get to that place. So I'm just hoping um, for the best. Um, and I, I think things will go fine in New York for our governor. But I think there are a lot of other places where we're going to be sorely disappointed because for some reason that kind of coalition building has been splintered over the past couple of years. One, one of the bright lights uh, that, that we're looking for is new people who have come up and be in New York. Alex Boris is one of them who's on the board uh, and, and, and others. And, and so the message that we carry forward and hopefully working with some of these future leaders uh, I think is very important. So I'd like to open it up for about five minutes to comments from the audience and any any questions. Alex, anything you, you want to say? <laughs> I appreciate your kind comments, Howard. No, I, I just, I, I, I think the, we're talking through a number of intersecting issues here from uh, how we can get uh, a more diverse group of people into office, uh, how the international touches the local, and, and I like this holistic way that we're discussing the many issues facing the Democratic Party. So I'd love to hear questions uh, that others have from the audience. 
and also recognize them, Mary Patterson, who's here, David's wonderful wife. So we're delighted that she's spending the time with us. Um, Hi. Who else has uh, some thoughts that they'd like to share? Well, I have a microphone right now. Can you hear me? Thanks. Yes. I just want to say that this has really been enlightened and um, for me. And I'm pleased to see that there are organizations out there supporting women. However, I think the party has missed quite an opportunity this year when I believe it's very important for people to get out and vote. And what I'm talking about is, if my memory is correct, it was only 1921 that women in this country got the right to vote, some women, free women. And last year, 100 years later, there was no recognition of this opportunity, uh, this right that women now have to get out there and make a difference. My thinking is there are more females in this country than males. And if the party had gotten behind women to say get out there and vote and show your power, if you had a campaign focused on women getting out to vote, as well as to run for office, that's happening. But people register and then they don't vote. And unless you get out and vote, we know what happens when you don't. So we have a few more days left before the election day, even though early voting has already started in a lot of places. So if you have money to spend on advertising, cut out those commercials that people have been seeing for weeks and start addressing women and their power of voting and to get out there and take control. Don't let the men control your life with abortion and the other issues that are out there. Get out there and vote and do that for yourself. Well said, thank you. Can As the microphone's getting passed, I just want to acknowledge Jerry Lippman, who's here, uh, who's owner of the Manhattan Sentinel and Long Island Jewish World. We're thrilled you're here. Yeah, I've got the mic. Uh, 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 my question is directed uh, specifically to Gillian, but uh, p please feel free to chime in, everyone. And that is, what are your colleagues uh, thinking in the inner sanctums of the UN, uh, the rank and file UN uh, uh, workers? What do they think about uh, our system, the US system of governance today, and the state of democracy? Uh? Well, as you know, the United Nations was founded in 1945. And I would say that for about 70 years, the US was the star, the role model, the example of a functioning democracy, not perfect, but, but uh, something to be respected and admired. Um, I'll be frank in this room, under the former president, he dismissed diplomacy, not just the UN, but diplomacy as a whole. He, didn't, he did not understand that words have power, words have meaning, and diplomacy um, can do more than, than the military can sometimes. And you need to appoint people who are qualified, which he didn't. The UN staff, the US staff to the UN was, uh, was reduced and, and, and the people he sent were not, um, in my view, not up to standard when you look at all the distinguished ambassadors we've had over time. One of my good colleagues said, and this pained me greatly, he said, it's as if the United States has diminished like that. We weren't present, we weren't visible, we weren't speaking up, we weren't leading, we weren't working in the normal way with our coalitions and, and our partners, big states and small states. And um, it, w it has been very damaging. Now the current uh, ambassador, Linda Thomas Greenfield, is excellent, she's qualified, she's experienced, she's doing her best, and her staff is good, but the whole State Demar Department was undermined, and applications to the Foreign Service dropped by 50%. 
So if we're going to be a leader in the world, we have to act like it. We have to get our ambassadors confirmed and in place. To this day, we don't have an ambassador in India or in Brazil because of the, 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 um, all the complications that they're putting in front of them in Washington. So I just think we, <laughs> this is, the United States is such an extraordinary country and we have to keep our high standards and act accordingly, not just within our country, but in our relationships with the larger world. I just, a uh, couple things uh, um, to follow. Uh, words matter and, and there's not a community that have felt the words stunging uh, than the Asian community, Asian American community in the last couple of years. Um, with the last president, and certainly with leadership in the Republican Party that are still spewing very hateful um, and damaging. I mean, obviously, it, it's, you know, we have seen anti-Asian hate crime rising over 391%. We've also seen anti-Semitism, you know, spiking um, hundreds of percentage. And it's a concern. It's major and that we don't just connect and talk to each other anymore. I mean, I just feel that um, we should have more engagements like this and others around the city, uh, certainly with people just not representing our own comfortable neighborhoods, but really doing their outreach, really sitting with people and really engaging in conversations, because I think that's really how the world changes and how minds are changed. And, and you know, we all can do that. I just want to take a uh, point of view and just thank many of my friends who are here to support me today. So thank you, friends. Um, and I, I think it's a point, because I, I just looked at the clock and I don't want, <laughs> I, I don't want everybody saying they don't keep their word. This was supposed to be over at 7.10, I think, or 7.15, so we're at a quarter of eight. Um, and it's been a wonderful one evening. Question. One question, is that right? Yeah, okay. sure. Okay. Um, I apologize if this is ne a next to question. Next to last <laughs> question. Fair enough. I apologize in advance if it's a dense question, but I'll provide some context. So in 2016, before Trump was elected, he saw the Ted Cruz campaign really employ the you know, psychographic data that they started using by kind of fishing for all the digital information was it found can trigger individuals based on emotion. Now, that group, Cambridge Analytica, that I think a lot of us are familiar with, ended up working with the Trump campaign and then we saw how successful that was. What we've seen recently is that a lot of factions within the Democratic Party have started to employ a lot of the same type of methods, where our campaigns are usually, traditionally, have been run based on substance rather than emotion. So my question would be to the group, to the entire panel, how do you believe we can get back into that type of campaigning within the Democratic Party that's based on substance rather than emotion? Yeah, th when you watch some of the campaigns that people we actually support, but some of their commercials, you sit there and think, well, who needs Republicans? Now we're acting like that. And in, in the sense that just finding the lowest common denominators of how to enrage people toward other people, rather than finding workable, sensible, and achievable goals that our candidate uh, would be able to employ if they get elected. And all it invites is this kind of um, this acrimony that is existing, and and it, it was, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, because it's not like people who are under the same uh, uh, party shield that we are aren't engaging in it as well. And at some point, there's gonna have to be a message that comes from above all of that. Uh, what Like what Michelle Obama said during the presidential election, when they go low, we go high. Well, that's got to really be what we're actually doing. But a lot of consultants and people who probably, I don't know that they care who wins an election one way or the other, as long as their technology uh, engenders some uh, revenue generation on their part, 
That's not why we spend so much time working on elections and campaigning. We're here to try to put valuable women and men into positions where they can take steps to ameliorate some of the problems that have ruined the quality of life for Americans, not to get into basically a pissing match on TV. Any last question? So on behalf of uh, New Democratic Dimensions, Tom, Lori, myself, the board, uh, we thank everyone for being here. We thank both Chung and Gillian, uh, and, and obviously Tony O and, and, and Charlie, uh, for honoring us uh, by accepting the award and being here this evening. It's a memorable one. Uh, we'll have a tape uh, of this. Uh, I guess I have to say, of course, all the candidates do, www.newdd.org. Uh, is the website of New Democratic Dimensions. Uh, this will be edited and will probably be up in a month or so. And uh, uh, that's it. So thanks very much. Thank you.